Look at that. That's a different thing altogether. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to share the screen. And let's see, I hope that this will work. Hold on a second. Um, okay, can you see this? Yeah, but could we get it a little larger? I'm going to try. That's not what that's for. This is the problem. Is I'm I am i am not that used to using it. Um, Zoom. Yeah, let's do maybe a little more than. Can you uh, let's do a little more? Where's my keys? Then? No, that's not good. Hold on. We're not going anywhere. Yeah. Well, we also want to. What about Zoom two? Wasn't that what you hit the first time? Oh. That didn't do anything. Oh, that didn't do anything. Okay. Zoom. So I'm going to do this. Can you read that? Yeah, that's bigger. Maybe maybe if you tried that one again, I don't know. I'm talking like I know, like I really like I'm so technologically channel challenged. It's ridiculous. Is there a place where you can put in a percentage enlargement? I Look don't like see it. I don't see that. Zoom too. Well, that's what I looked. That's what I tried before. Okay. Um, well, there it is. Magnification to uh, type oh, okay. in. Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Try that. Good. Oh, All right. That's okay. Perfect. All right. So here's a story. It. It's a, as the introduction says. It's actually part of um, a novel that she uh, wrote, um, and this is Francine Prose, an American uh, Jewish writer. Um, I always thought that her name was like perfect for a writer. <laughs> yeah, but not for a poet. Not for a poet. Mm -hmm. No. Not for a poet. So there, there it is. So here it is, we'll do the best we can. And this is called useful. So you know what, I'm gonna close my door because they're starting to clean up here. Okay. And uh, as it says, it starts with a Passover <coughs> Seder. So who'd like to uh, do the honor today? All right, Carney, go. All right, okay, useful ceremonies. I'm gonna have to get a little closer here. At the Passover Seder, they're talking about Davy Crockett. All the guests are about the same age and remember the same TV. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they're thinking of, as do I, as perhaps they are thinking of Davy Crockett because of Gail and Maury's country primitive decor. How at home he would feel on their shaker bench at their rough hewn colonial trussle table. The Alamo, says Gail. What was he doing there, Maury asks. I forget. Oh, shopping for a Bowie knife, says Gail's sister, Becky. Right, Gail says, putting it on his American Express. Becky sets down the spoon with which she's been feeding Gail and Maury's baby, Randy. Do you know me, she says, holding up an imaginary card. Perhaps you don't recognize me without that stupid raccoon hat. <laughs> <laughs> Had one of those. Everybody laughs, perhaps a little too heartily. They all know that Becky's having a difficult time. Right now, Becky feels okay. Tipsy on Manischewitz. Uh, the nostal Kits, the nostalgia drink, Gail calls it. And, and tempted to ask, how could they have got through the Seder with no one reading from the Haggadah and Davy Crockett in place of Elijah the prophet? But why criticize? At least Gail and Maury attend their local reform synagogue. And why be ungrateful when Gail and Maury are letting Becky spend two weeks with... Yeah. Oh, wrong. How do I get out of that? I feel lost. Yeah, you yeah, did. Yeah. Go, yeah, go oh, back there and then okay, navigate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that, that works. Okay, we go zoom to. 
gonna try it again. And now we're gonna go. The thing is, I need. Oh, again. Before the trouble started. All right. Zoom to seven hundred and eight percent. They give you that as as a as an option. Okay. Okay. So the pro ah here it is. I'm gonna do it over here. Okay. So here it is. This I don't need. How do I get rid of this part? Mm. No, that's not what I do. Um, how do I get you rid of Just expand the window. Maybe that would be enough for me to get the whole thing. Mm. No, no, okay. So I need. I need. It's a good anyway, size. Here, need... is, here we are. So here we are, and I need. Here we are. The problem is, how do I get this? What about the little square box to expand right at the top on the that's top what I right? Did. That's what I did before. That's what oh, I did. Oh, never before. mind. Sorry. Remember? Okay. So, okay, hold on a second. I figured this out before. And I don't want it. Come on. Arnie, you're supposed to be like a maven here. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I'm a little little lost myself here. Huh? <clears throat> what about can, the can arrow? You, can you can you drag the, the right hand corner of the page and make the whole page? Or I, I, no, I guess what you really need is to get rid of that column on the right, but I don't see how to do. In that. The, in the middle of the um, page, on, where that column on the right that you want to get rid of, there's a, where it says redact. Right to the left of that, there's an arrow, and maybe if you push that arrow it will expand no, uh, yeah i tried that the other time and it oh okay sorry yep i mean it's all good all good uh, suggestions like i said but not good enough Boy. no no hi hi oh, <laughs> i was going to suggest take it down and okay. start okay. over here we go again ready okay here we go one second <laughs> And I have to rotate. And I want to get rid of this. Maybe thing. it's because you're on a different computer than you usually you could, do. You could uh, just send me the PDF, it, it PDF is, and I you it could is send me. I, I can't, I don't know how to work this whole business here. I, you could I send, the, send the file to me as a PDF and I could read it from my own computer. <clears> or, or. Well, let's try. Let's go copy editing, you know. This is from Safari. No, I made the PDF. Oh, well, you, then you could send, the, send me the PDF and I could right. just read it. But, but the problem is just working with this screen share. All right. Anyway, let's try one more time. Okay. Oh, but first I wanted to make it bigger. Right. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to zoom. To, oh, so you're making it bigger before you share it. I'm going to make it bigger before I share it. Oh. Let's see what happens if I do that. Okay. And then, come on. Hey, what do you think of that? Ooh. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, we go like this. So let's just go back down because we forgot the whole story already. No, it's sort of lower. No, but there it is right here. And why, why be ungrateful? Don't see it yet. Last, last second, next to last line, last three words. No, I'm not, it's not, it's not on the it's screen. It's not shared. It's not shared. Oh, cause I didn't share it. I didn't share. Oh, you want everything, huh? <laughs> I'm telling you, I give you a finger, you want a hand. <laughs> Everything's discombobulated. It's right before Pesach. What do you want? Right here. Okay. Good. All right. So, and, and why? Right here. So, and why I, be ungrateful when Gail and Maury are letting Becky spend two weeks with, with them in Tuckahoe, hiding out from her regular life, her loft, her husband, Jack, the gallery she and Jack own together. The last dinner Jack and Becky went to was in a sculptor's Chelsea loft. The Japanese chef made sushi. Becky said, don't you think sushi's like some kind of drug? 
I mean, you get this great protein rush, but six hours later, you better eat something quick or you get suicidal. There's a silence. Then a woman named Darlene sighed and said, well, I think sushi's like sex. Later, Darlene got up to go home and Jack, without a word to Becky, put on his coat and went with her. Darlene's half Malaysian, a critic for the London Punk Art Journal. It's the least of her problems, but still, Becky's horrified that she's been left for a woman with a mouseketeer name. The brisket Becky's mashing with the back of her fork to feed Randy couldn't be less like sushi. For this alone, Becky <clears throat> feels a rush of warmth towards Gail. He's been saying all week that what got Becky into trouble was asking too many questions. It wasn't the number of questions, thinks Becky, but asking the same one too often. Next year was how Jack always answered. Next year, Becky will be 40, and until the sushi party had been making a point of it. Jack said he was sorry, he understood. He needed to think more about what having a child would mean. This is what it means, Becky thinks now. Meat, plate, fork to mouth. No need to think any further. If only she'd known enough to say that. Hmm, Kentucky, Gail saying. No wait, Tennessee. Kentucky's Daniel Boone. Killed him a bar when he was only three, Maury says. Three? <clears throat> Hear that? Becky says to baby Randy. You still got a year and a half. Gail has talked Becky into collecting books for the Temple Sisterhood book drive. Eventually, the books will go into a, to an orphanage in Haifa. Every afternoon, Gail gives Becky a list of names and directions, buckles Randy into his car seat, and sends them out to cruise the suburban streets shaped like horseshoes and keyholes named for developers' daughters and wives. Right on Beverly, Becky says to Randy. Left on Caroline. <coughs> left on Lorraine. Mostly it's older women who've signed up to donate books. They all assume that Randy is Becky's baby, and Becky doesn't correct them. The women seem glad to see Becky and Randy instead of the man in the truck they were probably expecting. They invite Becky in for coffee and cake, and Randy, who has a winning personality and can be trusted with an inch in a plastic cup, gets a lot of attention and juice. Becky knows these women. Wednesday afternoons, they troop through the gallery by the busload. At first, Becky thought they were only into it. Into it. For the dressing up and slumming. But after a while, she observed how interested they were. Now, seeing their gropper and Sawyer prints, she wonders, interested in what? Becky's most successful artist is a 22-year-old German who thinks giant, who makes giant pachinko machines. Does anybody Sometimes, know what a pachinko machine is? I was leaving that for the group. I was going to crowdsource the uh, answer for that. Yeah, somebody help it's me a, out it's here. It's one of these little games. It's it's like a mini pinball type of a thing. Okay. Oh. I I, I thought it's something I where think, you drop something I think. down and it goes all over the place. All right. Well, anyway, so you have to go to their gallery and you'll find out. <laughs> Sometimes, especially when the women boast about their ch children's careers, Becky longs to mention the gallery. The personal conversation might lead to her having to admit that Randy isn't her baby and it doesn't seem worth it. The fantasy they're enacting, that she and the women are joined in some sisterhood of mothers and babies and grown children, still present in the high school earth science texts that their mothers are giving Becky, sweeter than whatever satisfaction she might get from chattering about the art world. Jack has promised to spend these two weeks moving his things out of their loft. Gail promises he'll come back. Becky's promised Gail that if he does, she'll just get pregnant and not ask so many questions. For practice, Becky decides not to ask what the orphans in Haifa will do with the boxfuls of Reader's Digest the condensed Herman Wooks. Not asking lets Becky feel so sincerely appreciative that sometimes tears come to her eyes as she thanks the women for their generosity. Becky's truly grateful, though not just for the books. She feels some useful ceremony is taking place here, blessing her days with rhythm and purpose. An astonishing feeling for someone whose husband is, perhaps at this very moment, dividing his books and records from hers. Gail knew this would, be, would do Becky good. She says Becky needs to get out of herself and plug into a community. Gail was always expecting an expert at conning her, in this case, into picking up books and, and babysitting Randy at the same time. 
Still, Becky wonders if Gail might not be right. Perhaps it's the weather, the daffodils and forsythia, fresh air. But often, driving Randy around to the women's houses, Becky is reminded of the summer she and Jack spent in California, driving their Renarec convertible. She has that same breezy notion that if she just times things well, everything will be all right. And maybe that's why it always seems a good omen when at the end of the afternoon, she pulls into Gail's driveway with Randy so newly and deeply asleep that he can be carried into the house for a long nap in the crib. Since Becky's been at Gale, she's taken to mixing herself exotic cocktails she ordinarily wouldn't touch. Grasshoppers, Brandy Alexanders, and silently toasting Darlene, Singapore slings. She can't drink very many, but is amazed how easily they go down. And if she adds enough alcohol, how optimistic they make her feel. Becky takes a pitcher and glass to Gale's garage, and there, among the mulchers and power tools Maury never uses, looks through the books she's collected. Becky keeps expecting treasure, illustrated children's classics. Illuminated. Good guess. Illuminated prayer books, Victorian medical guides. But now, as always, aside from the high school text, it's mostly 50s bestsellers, biographies of World War II generals, reports on mega corporations and the CIA. So Becky's astonished when halfway through her second mango daiquiri, she finds an old edition of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. The book is covered in navy blue silk embossed with gold letters. It weighs a ton and it's full of engravings. Turning back to see how they illustrate the Headless Horseman's ride, Becky discovers an envelope. Inside is a note. Even before she reads it, Becky feels that the note was meant for her. But whoever wrote it knew what kind of book would attract her. The note says, Flexner's killing me. My husband, Lou Flexner, is crazy. He's trying to kill me. Please help. The name sounds familiar, but Becky has been to eight houses that afternoon. She goes to the car where the list of names is still on the front seat. Flexner, comma, Irene is third from last. Irene Flexner, Becky finally remembers, was the doyenne of the Larchmont Tudor Castle. Its gray stucco facade so chilly and forbidding it made the interior, the thick white carpeting, the white sectional couch as massive and serpentine as the Great Wall seemed doubly lush and inviting. Mrs. Flexner in a pale linen suit, her platinum hair pulled up in a neat whoop, curled up under ponytail was perhaps 60 but looked 45, like a grandmother in one of those ads with three generations of women all looking terrific. <laughs> Mrs. Flexner had gazed at her, at her coolly till Becky mentioned the books. Of course, she said, cutie pie, she said, leaning down to Randy. How old is he? Uh, she? He, Becky said, 18 months. Oh, that's the best age, Mrs. Flexner said. They just love you. Then she said, come on, and took off across the living room at a speed Becky found particularly impressive because the carpet was so thick and Mrs. Flexner was wearing such thin high heels. If you could balance on pencils over three inches of wool, you could do anything. Like so many of the women Becky had met this week, Mrs. Flexner projected competence, the energy and nerve to drive the Hutchinson River Parkway from a book discussion group to a grocery clear across Westchester for some treat for a visiting grandchild. If anybody Becky knew moved that fast, she'd assume they were on drugs. Mrs. Flexner paused in the kitchen where a large middle-aged black woman was unloading the dishwasher. This is my friend, Mrs. Nelson, she said. Becky was embarrassed by this loose use of the word friend, but Mrs. Nelson nodded pleasantly and looked past her at Randy, whom she focused on, cooing musical Jamaican variations on nice little boy. Randy smiled back at her, quizzical and sweet. Mama's big man, big little man, Mrs. Nelson said, and Becky thought, Mama? She could fool Mrs. Nelson, she could fool anyone. She knew this was racist, probably untrue, but still a rush of good humor stayed with her till Mrs. Flexner, leading her out of the kitchen past the gleaming Queen Anne dining room whispered, she's been with us forever, she's terrific. Mrs. Flexner sighed, 
a side rich with knowledge of the injustice that makes some women unload others' dishwashers, and with faith in the human nobility that transcends all that. Becky was relieved when, pleading a late lunch date, Mrs. Flexner showed her the books, then called Mrs. Nelson in to hold Randy while Becky loaded the car. Becky can hardly believe that stylish, efficient Irene Flexner could have written that note. She doesn't know what to do about it, or if she should do anything at all. Rereading it, she decides the whole thing depends on how you take the word kill. This is killing me, Becky's mother used to say about everything. Though what did kill her and Becky's father, a drunken teenager's 68 dart, she never even saw coming. Becky opens a book on Jewish law and skimming a chapter on medieval doctrinal disputes, finds a, a reference to the Talmudic ruling that it is criminal to know about and not expose a crime. Becky takes this as a sign. And though she knows no crime's been committed, has only to imagine a short newspaper item about a lar Larchmont housewife found dead in the woods near her home. Becky tiptoes into the house, making the wide boards squeak. Otherwise, it's so quiet she can hear Randy snoring and Gail, Gail's potter's wheel whirring in the basement. Standing at the kitchen phone, Becky finds Flexner on Gail's list and dials. When Mrs. Flexner picks up, Becky explains that she was the one who came for the books. Does Mrs. Flexner have any more? There's a silence. Becky's certain that Mrs. Flexner knows she's found the note. Maybe, Mrs. Flexner says. Then Yes, can you come back tomorrow evening at eight? Eight seems like an odd time to pick up books until Becky realizes dinner time. Mr. Flexner will almost certainly be home. Is Mrs. Flexner asking Becky to serve as a witness and protection? All right, eight, Becky says, feeling as if they're speaking in code. Two spies out of Mission Impossible. The next day, when Randy asks Becky for his juice bottle, she spends five minutes staring into his diaper bag. She gets lost twice and comes down from an old woman's barricaded Yonkers flat to find that she's left Gail's car keys in the ignition. At six, Gail, Becky, and Randy eat an early dinner. Maury's working late. Becky is dizzy from the three white Russians she's drunk, but doesn't want Gail to notice as she asks to use Gail's car. Still, Gail could hardly refuse when Becky tells her it's about getting more books. Hey, says Gail, aren't you working this a little hard? Becky looks. Uh, he looks at her. Can't qu quite focus. And Gail, misreading her blurry look, says, don't tell me. You met someone. You want the car for a, a tryst behind the pizza joint at the Mile Square Mall. That's Becky met anyone? She goes through the faces she saw that day, then the faces of men she thought were attractive when she was with Jack. But Jack's the only one she wants to see, wants to tell about the Flexners. As a teenager, she used to imagine boys she liked, dropping in miraculously on cousins' weddings and boring waits at the dentist. Suppose she drove to the mall and there was Jack, signaling her with his lights. You'd only tell her not to go see Mrs. Flexner. What if the husband turns out to be a real psycho? It's funny how thinking of Jack has made Becky start feeling afraid. Probably Becky should tell Gail what, where she's going, just in case. But some part of her refuses to include Gail, to let her have security and vicarious adventure. Becky's problems aren't Gail's fault, yet for a, a moment she resents and even envies Gail the safe, dull life she's chosen. Gail doesn't even have to wonder if Mari might not really be working late, that he might be the one trysting behind Mile Square Plaza, uh, Mile Square Pizza. <laughs> Becky's on the point of suggesting this possibility or some equally venomous and undeserved, something that will wound Gail and stay between them for months. Could this be the moment for her to bring up a fact they have never discussed? That Mari designs software for a company Gail and Becky both picketed during the Vietnam War. They could be cruel to each other in ways someone, might else not someone else might not register. How does Gail think Becky feels when Gail describes holding newborn Randy and wishing time would just stop? Becky looks out the window, it's already dark. She doesn't see well at night and could easily get lost and drive some cul-de-sac until she runs out of gas. 
Imagine the relief of calling up and canceling. But this, Becky thinks, is what people mean when they say, I couldn't live with myself if I did. At this hour, there's no way of taking Ra Randy, though Becky will miss his company. She's glad that time has decided for her. If Randy were her child, if she had a child, she probably wouldn't go. Her sense of what risk she would take change. Perhaps it's better to be unencumbered, to have freedom to be brave, Becky tells herself, and is instantly demoralized by how small and pitiful her consolations seem. Where's your baby, cries Mrs. Flexner the moment she opens the door. This is the moment for Becky to explain that Randy isn't strictly speaking hers. It's like those times when she's forgotten someone's name and hedges, waiting for it to come to her. And suddenly there's no turning back. If she doesn't tell the truth, she never can. Oh, my sister's taking care of him, she says. Becky looks past Mrs. Flexner into the kitchen. Mrs. Nelson isn't around. She wonders if Mrs. Flexner confides in Mrs. Nelson. If Mrs. Flexner is so afraid, how she must hate to see Mrs. Nelson leave. Becky's imagination is spinning. She reminds herself, this is Westchester, not some misty manor, manor house in Gaslight or Rebecca. Still, Becky's throat feels tight as Mrs. Flexner ushers her into the living room. There's a part of the room Becky, Becky overlooked this afternoon, a corner where the pastels give way to polished woodwork, bookshelves, gentlemen's club leather chairs. Becky's noticed how little in these houses seems to belong to the men. Men tucked away like secrets in drawers full of clean razor creased okay. shirts. At least Mrs. Mr. Flexner has his corner and fills it, just as he completely fills the wing chair in which he sits reading. Becky's met dozens of guys like him, 60-ish, slightly overweight, handsome away in a way that has less to do with beauty than with confidence, with getting your own way in the world. The light from the reading lamp shines on his thick, clean white hair. But he also seems lit from within, an aura which makes Becky think it's possible to radiate, to literally radiate success. There's something a little hard about it, an edge of the street smart and tough. But, but Becky recalls newspaper photos of suburban and execs indicted for putting out contracts on their wives. Flexner isn't a killer. That note must have been metaphorical. Flexner looks up from the barons he's reading, but doesn't stand up. This is the young lady from the book drive I told you about, Mrs. Flexner says. She has the most beautiful baby. Girl or boy, Mr. Flexner asks. Not that it matters much these days. Boy, Becky says, and Mr. Flexner nods. Becky thinks, well, at least she has the right kind of baby. Then she realizes with a small shock, she's almost convinced herself that Randy's hers. Well, we have three, Mrs. Flexner says, a boy and two girls, all grown, no grandchildren yet. She makes a little pout then, including Becky says, I thought we could all have a bite of dinner. Then I have some more books for you. Come, keep me company in the kitchen. Mrs. Flexner won't let Becky help. It begins to, to tells her to sit while she checks the thermometer in the roast and begins cutting iceberg lettuce into chunks. What does your husband do? She asks. Briefly, Becky's confused. If she claimed Gail's baby, should she pretend to be her husband too? And she talk about Maury's job? Husband. She should she pretend to Should she pretend to her husband to her pretend to her husband too and talk about Maury's job? We run an art gallery, she says. How fascinating, Mrs. Flexner says. My husband's a developer. Or anyway, he was. Now he can just sit in his office and play with figures. Well, if that's what makes him happy. Mrs. Flexner smiles. She could be talking about a toddler playing with pots and pans, or maybe Becky just thinks that because that's what Randy may be doing right, right now. Yes, right, right now. Good. If Becky had stayed at Gale, she could be getting ready to, to bathe Randy. If only Randy were here. Randy's the one, not Gail and not Jack, who could get her through this meal. Becky feels a stab of longing, a nearly physical pain. How remarkable that she should miss Randy's body more than Jack's. Well, 
That's what Flexner says. Better figures on paper than on girls. Is Becky supposed to laugh? Is this the moment to mention the note? But now Mrs. Flexner is carving the roast. The whine of her electric knife prohibits conversation. That meat is done perfectly, Becky shouts above the noise. Again, Mrs. Flexner smiles as she picks up the platter and lets Becky bring in the salad. The atmosphere is warm and faintly conspiratorial, as if they're children bringing mud pies to mom and dad, or concubines bearing delicacies for the Shah. Food's on, Mrs. Flexner calls. Her husband lumbers towards the table and takes his seat at its head. Irene serves out the food and suddenly Becky grows dizzy with the sense that she's sitting down with her parents. It's been 10 years since their deaths, long enough for Becky to be taken by surprise when she is, as she is now, overcome with missing them. After a while, Irene says, Lou, Gail's husband has an art gallery in Manhattan. Becky thinks, Gail's husband? then realizes how mixed up things really are. Gail was the one who first contacted Mrs. Flexner. And Becky has never introduced herself by name. Where? Lou Flexner says. Art gallery. Where? Soho, says Becky. West Broadway. Lou Flexner leans back in his chair. Huh, it's all corporate, he says. More and more. Pretty soon your only customer is going to be the corporation. Corporazioni. Becky says, corporate Milan. Lou Flexner raises one eye. He seems impressed that she can pronounce one eyebrow. it. One eyebrow. One eyebrow. Uh, one eyebrow. He seems impressed that she can pr pronounce a five syllable Italian word. She doesn't even know if it's a real Italian word, but that doesn't seem to matter. She looks at Becky and looks back, aware that some funny, in some funny way they are flirting. Becky concentrates on her plate and so has her mouth full, full of roast beef when Lou Flexner says. So that's where the art money is? Becky smiles and points to her mouth, turning to Irene as she does so, offering this awkwardness with the food as proof that she, she is no threat. Right, Becky says. Italians and 40-year-olds who just inherited the family Honda lot. Well, that's my son any day now, Mr. Flexner says, except with him, it'll be the construction business. Not any day now, says Mrs. Flexner and knocks on the wooden table. Well, art's not a bad investment, Becky says. Oh, bullshit, says Lou Flexner. It's a bullshit investment. I'd only buy the stuff if I liked it. You think I'd like it? Well, sure, says Becky. Though it's hard to say what Lou Flexner would make of Rainier's pachinko machines. Liking wouldn't even come into it. Well, sure this time with more conviction. Maybe I should come down and take a look at it, Lou Flexner says. You got a card? Her and her husband's card, says Mrs. Flexner, stopping Becky, who's reaching into her purse. She does have a card with her name and Jack's. How would she explain that? Uh, no, she says, sorry. There's a silence. Then Mrs. Flexner says, you know whose work I especially like? Whose? asked Becky, checking the walls for a clue. Bernard's. Mrs. Flexner said. Oh, his paintings are so lovely, Becky says. She knows it's not the most original thing that's ever been said about Bernard, whose paintings Becky really does like. But what seems important right now is to show some solidarity with Mrs. Flexner. Mr. Flexner says, Irene, where did you get the roast? White Plains, I think, she says. Why? Whoops, 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 whoops. Oh. whoops. There we are. Stringy, her husband says. Gail's eating it, Mrs. Flexner says. Becky looks down at her plate. It's half empty. Gail could have eaten it for all the pleasure or nourishment Becky's gotten. Mrs. Flexner says, I'll tell you something about Bernard, something you probably don't know. When his wife died, after 46 years of marriage, the man just went to pieces. He never painted another nude, never painted so much of any, never painted much of anything. Four years later, he died of a broken heart. Irene, says Mr. Flexner, stop it. Well, that's the difference between Bernard and the men of today, Mrs. Flexner says. An artist like that, he knew love, he knew beauty. All today's men know is running around with their 30-year-old secretaries. It's clear that Mrs. Flexner isn't speaking abstractly. Oh, Becky thinks, poor Irene. 
So running around with a 30 year old secretary is better than what Becky might have imagined from Mrs. Flexner's note. It's bad enough. Mrs. Flexner turns to Becky asking, don't you think 30 is a little young for a man my husband's age? It occurs to Becky that Mrs. Flexner probably thinks she is 30 and wants her by agreeing to suggest that Flexner is too old for her. Becky's reluctant to hurt Flexner. At the same time, she can't help thinking that 30 does seem young, especially compared to her age, 39. This isn't the time to talk about this, Flexner says. Flexner says now. Nope. No, no, uh, Flexner says. Oh, well, when is the time? Asks Irene. For three days, it hasn't been time to talk about you spending the second Seder night with her. What did her family think? That you weren't 63 and married? Irene puts her hands over her face and starts to cry. Becky and Flexner look at each other. Suddenly everything's reversed. Now they're the parents and Irene's the difficult child with whom they must somehow cope. Becky so wants to comfort Irene, she has to fight the desire to say, hey, happens to everyone. My other husband left me for a woman named Darlene. Irene goes into the kitchen, sobbing louder and more harshly the further away she gets. Even her tears are like a child's, meant for the grown-ups to hear. There are a million questions Becky wants to ask and doesn't. Nor does she do what she should do, leave. Instead, she sits at the table and stares at Lou, she thinks. Time has stopped. Not at a moment either of them would have chosen. Lou looks slightly past Becky. His face so expressionless, she could have caught him deep in thought or glancing in the mirror. Free to examine his face, Becky understands what a 30-year-old might see there. He can take care of things. He can decide. He and Irene have two daughters and a son. Strangely, Becky's thinking about the books. Did Irene really have any for her? Is it too late, too late to ask Lou? How nice it would be to have something to take back to Gales, to sit on the garage floor and let the musty smell of old books intoxicate her, put her into a kind of stupor from which it would be difficult to get up. It's how she used to feel on hot summer days, sitting on the floor of her mother's attic, looking through boxes of family photos, shuffling those cracked brown prints of forgotten relatives, courting couples, new, newlyweds, new babies. Probably these cartons are in Gail's garage. Becky hates it that Gail has inherited them by default, but her loft never seems safe, permanent enough to house anything so irreplaceable. How could she and Jack have had a child if they couldn't even do that? From the other room, Irene's cries go more strident and less human. They sound like those distant, oddly aquatic roars that echo from time to time through the zoo. Or, Becky realizes the surprise, like I Love Lucy's panicky cry of anxiety and fright. She remembers the last time she heard Lucille Ball make that uncontrolled rhythmic animal sound. She even remembers the episode, the one in which Lucy gets a job packing chocolates in a candy factory and the assembly line keeps spitting chocolates at her faster and faster and faster. Becky knows just where she saw it. She can picture herself and Gail lying on their stomachs, their faces cupped in their hands, inches from the TV screen at the foot of their parents' bed. The memory is so vivid, it summons up much that has happened since, as well as much that should have happened and didn't. Suddenly, suddenly, it's as if all those past and unrealized events are swirling around her. And Becky feels as if she and Lou Flexner are the couple in an insurance commercial that she's seen cartoon man and woman standing rigid while houses, cars, children, appliances, pets, while all things there are to lose go on falling behind them like rain. As you can tell, that's the end of the story. It is. <laughs> yeah. I hate that. <laughs> it it just story. stops in the middle. It's like there's, there's got to be something else going on. There is. <laughs> But we don't know about it. Right. Well, so you have to read the rest of the novel. Um, what can I tell you? Oh, it's so this is just an excerpt? Character? It's apparently a piece of a novel. Ah. <laughs> well, it's a good story. <laughs> Why is it a good story? Well, I, I, uh, 
it's it, 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 I, 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 I love the, her vivid inner inner monologue. Uh, you know, she does nothing is quite as it seems, and the, nothing strikes her the way that she hopes it would. <laughs> I found it interesting where she was talking about a 60 year old uh, going, you know, with a, a 60 year old man with a 30 year old thing. Maybe I'm being more, I feel it more today, but I know what my, what my age is now. And you, and I certainly don't look at it, but it ages, it's your chronological age that's, that's on your papers, but it also ages with how you feel. And I'll tell you, I feel a hell of a lot younger than my chronological age, especially today. All right, good, good for you. Josie, what are you saying? Um, do we know it's part of a novel? When uh, it says in the, in the intro, I'll read it one more time, hold on. It says that her books are Animal Magnetism, Bigfoot Dreams, Primitive People, The Peaceable Kingdom, Guided Tours of Hell, an essay is blah blah blah. The main topic in the literature is uh, useful ceremonies is part of women and children first. Okay. From 1988. Yeah, yeah I, I know she's a very fine writer. I'm happier to know it's part of something else. Because by itself, I think it's kind of confusing. Well, you know, welcome to her mind. <laughs> right. Right. Welcome to, to her uh, own situation. Let me let me ask. Um, what what do you what do you think the study of of the of of the seder um, does for for this? Or does it do anything? The fact that it opens with a seder and it mentions also the seder when uh, she's in the you know at dinner with the with the flexners. Um, what what's the deal with the seder? Do you have any 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 Thoughts about that? And do you remember what the name of this uh, little story, uh, this little thing? Useful this ceremonies. Ceremonies. Yeah. Well, she she mentions um, somewhere in there that um, I, I guess she was referring to the Seder that it gives some some kind of rhythm or I don't know continuity to her her life, which might feel chaotic to her. That the Seder, you know, it comes mm. around. Once a year, it lasts a week. Uh, we have these meals, um, so maybe, maybe that's the purpose that it's reflecting on some stability for her in her life. But it seemed more like a meal as opposed to a seder, right? Um, and so, and some people just just get together at, at uh, Passover for a meal. And, and they don't, or they just do a, a short bit of, of the beginning before the meal. But it didn't feel like a Seder to me. They well, talked about it, but... Yeah, it's, it's mentioned, it's, it's mentioned that, you know, some Seder, they're talking about Davy Crockett, they're not talking about going out of Egypt. Um, so Well, they finished that part already. No, it mentions in the story that they don't talk about this, they don't... Oh, right, right, you're right, yeah. They don't engage, actually, in, right, right. in Seder conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, what what does what does it mean for that guy, you know, Mr. Flexner, to go to his to his mistress's house for a second seder? I mean, you know, and 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 his wife is like completely appalled and shocked by this. What is what were you thinking? What do you think they were thinking? What was he thinking actually? What how does that work? And that, that to show up at the seder. Um, why is that something that he has to do? But of course, actually, like just staying with his wife is not something that he has to do. Yeah, Josie. I, I don't think it matters to him. I don't think he's involved in the holiday at all. So why is he showing up to the Seder? I think to him, it's just an invitation for dinner. I don't think he sees it as a religious experience. If he did, he's really being rotten. <laughs> but but if he's going but if he's open about going to his to the second seder with his i want to say mistress for lack of a better word but why is he so open with his wife about it and his wife knows about it that makes no sense unless they have an open marriage well they obviously don't because she's upset yeah so, uh, um she knows about it 
but that doesn't mean that she's happy and and he knows she knows so there's nothing to hide but then it doesn't make sense well he does seem to be making a point it's not about making sense it's about what he wants to do right? he's he selfish do what, what he wants to do yeah he, what well, he's making a point go ahead no yeah. i mean yeah that that he goes where he wants and what entertains him. Isn't Pesach called the Festival of Freedom? <laughs> <laughs> that's stretching it a bit, I think, Rabbi. Well, that's the question. What does it mean to stretch it? What does that actually yeah, mean? What, what other Jewish uh, elements do we have in this story? Hmm. Why, sounds... is she, why is she collecting the books? Oh, yeah. To send, to send them to, to yes. Haifa. And, and who's sending them? Who's in charge of sending the books to Haifa? To the orphanage yeah. of Haifa? The sisterhood. The synagogue. Right? So, yeah, the synagogue sisterhood. Synagogue sisterhood. Right? So that's, this is, there's a, in a certain way, there's a very, I mean, you know, this is, um, there's a lot of Jewish in this except that it has no content. It's all social, right? Mm. It's all the fact that they are, you know, they're Jews and they're connected in some kind of Jewish way. Gail and Maury are members of a reform synagogue. So, you know, who is, who is Becky to, you know, to point fingers? You know, at least they do something. You know, why should she complain about the Seder? At least they're doing what they're doing. Mm. Um, you know, so there's these, and, and clearly, you know, uh, the Flexners are a Jewish couple. They've raised three Jewish kids. You know, however Jewish the kids are, we don't know. Uh, but uh, you know, he's uh, you know they're in a neighborhood, I guess, uh, where that's you know that's a reality, a social reality. It's a bunch of Jews here, right? She's collecting. Here's the name that Gail gives her. Here's the names of the people. They'll be happy to give to the sisterhood book drive. For a worthy cause, right? Um, what's our picture of of uh, of of the the socioeconomic rich. status of? Yeah, they're all really okay, right? They're real. They're all. Uh, although she says she goes at one point, she goes to some cramped apartment in in a uh, in a, an apartment house, right, where she picks up some books from somebody. So, the sectors uh, are rich. What? The Flexners are obviously Flexners are, are, are doing okay. Can't complain. I can't complain. Um, I I was intrigued with that little Passover themed uh, touch of uh, of the uh, you know the the uh, the cook the 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 the, the, the maid or the slave. Mm -hmm. Introduce um, right. Mrs. Mm. Nelson, right? Who's uh, oh, she's terrific. Right, uh, and and uh, Mrs. Flexner's consciousness of, on the one hand, you know, I know that you know there's something wrong about the fact that this terrific person is is really subject to my every whim. Right, she's she says just got to do her, you know, menial work. You know, and there's nothing essentially better about me than her, and yet I call all the shots. Right, I'm I'm the I'm the boss. Um, but isn't Mrs. Nelson the hired help? As opposed to as opposed to not being paid, she's paid to do these these tasks. She's she's paid. I don't think she can afford to buy a house that Mrs. Flexner has. Of course not. So what do you mean? Of course not. Why? If she's essential, you know. If she's she's essential. She's essential, but she doesn't. Judge, but she's not in the same uh, in uh, income uh, category as the Flexner. Decides that. Who decides? Who decides that? Who decides what work is worth a million dollars an hour and what work is worth? You know, the, the less, less you know, we, we throw that, that term as essential workers around a lot these days, but we don't mm -hmm. actually. And a lot of essential workers are, are, are paying are paid minimum wage, unfortunately. Or less. They're paid less than minimum wage. So uh, this is the reality. So, you know, the, the idea that here's this person, I mean, this is a whole classic, uh, uh, you know, theme as well, to how dependent the boss is on the slave. Uh, and yet, of course, the slave is still the slave, even though the slave has a certain kind of power because they know how to live, they know how to cook, let's say, they know how to take care of the kids, they know how to, you know, find everything in the house. Um, but uh, on the other hand, 
the you know the uh, the incompetent boss is the one with all the real power, right? Um, and uh, so there was a, a little bit of, a little bit of that in the story also. A little bit of an, an irony, I guess, that the you know, celebrating the liberation from Egypt while they've got the slave here that they don't notice. Right. Right. Mm. Right. I thought of something very weird. Do you think that um, the name Flexner is on purpose um, rhyming with <laughs> Wexner? Isn't Wexner the Wex the Wexner Fellows or the what? I mean, the, the time maybe... <laughs> period might be different. I don't think I don't think that in 1988. That was a ready. Okay, no, I was I just curious. So. I wasn't sure exactly when Wexner was. Well, um, I think if the name, I think flex, flexible. You know. Flex yeah, I think I think his his principles and his religion are flexible. Very flexible. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Right. right. So uh, yeah, um, and of course, uh, this is a very feminist uh, story, right? You've got two rotten husbands. Um, and uh, you know, then the, the, the women who have to suffer for it. So, uh, just to point out that in the Pesach story, um, the rabbi said, Why were we, you know, liberated from Egypt? The answer is because of the righteous women, right? There's a lot of sterling examples of uh, righteousness and courage in the Passover story that are all women. Right, the midwives that stand up to Pharaoh, right. and of course the daughter, oh. the daughter of Pharaoh herself, and Miriam, uh, watching over her little brother. Right, so there's these, uh, you know, recurring uh, uh, figures of of uh, women who are principled and courageous, fearless, um, and they are the ones that, uh, without them. We wouldn't be here today talking about the uh, Passover. So, okay. Anybody else have anything else to say, or, or we're gonna wrap it up a minute or two early? Well, a lot of uh, I have I have a com uh, not a comment, a, 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 an idea, a request. I don't know. Do Do you think you would be able to, um, after we read these stories, to, to um, send around a PDF or whatever it is we're reading from? Because Sometimes, um, you know, I want to go back and think of something or maybe my mind wandered and I forget what was said or, you know, something like that, where we can go back and think about this some more. So I, I, I'm of two minds about it. I think I think, that, you know, I certainly think it's a wonderful thing to do. I'm a little just a tiny tad uh, wary about the fact that I'm. Um, infringing on people's copyright. Copyright, okay, that's, that's fair. That makes so, sense. So it's one that thing you know, to sort of like, you know, let's share it, let's all read the story together. Uh, okay. Give out free copies of the book. So- um, Yeah, I can support that. Good, okay. But write down, write down the name of the author, write down- Yeah, the I do. Well, and then, uh, you know, enjoy. Yeah. Carney, you wanted to say something. Oh, no, just, uh, as an aside, a lot of as someone who grew up in non-Jewish Westchester around this time, a lot of it is completely familiar. The fact mm -hmm. that Jewishness is kind of subdued. All right. It, yeah. I, I think it. I think it just depends on your upbringing. Because what I thought of in the beginning of the uh, story was how they said that uh, I believe they said they they were reformed, but I remember my father was brought up Orthodox. My mother was brought up reform and my paternal grandfather was liberal in his thinking because my father didn't want to go to Orthodox shul. And when he married my mother, uh, he wanted to go to the reform. And my, uh, my paternal grandfather said, I think it's better you going reform and observing than being Orthodox and not going at all. All right. So it, it was interesting. But then again, on my father's side of the family, because they were married by, my parents were married by a reform rabbi, my sister and I were considered bastards for a while because we, there wasn't an Orthodox service. There you go. Uh, really? So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's crazy how you put it together, but, <laughs> but we're all Jews, no matter which way we observe or don't observe or how we feel. Hmm. So I, want to wish everyone, I want to wish everyone a sweet Pesach. Yes. You too, to everybody. Freedom in whichever way you can uh, manage it. And uh, 
That's it, right? Yeah. Oh, I, one more question. Um, I saw that there's a lot going on on Saturday and Sunday for for Passover services and things. So, but they they haven't canceled um, uh, Talmud and um, Perkei Avot. But to be canceled. It's going to both and the following weekend also. They they were told it's supposed to be canceled. They said they canceled it. Okay. All right. Well, I would I just, imagine when I would imagine when Shomer Week comes out tomorrow, it'll, it'll be. Yeah, I just wanted to check and put it on my calendar. No, but it should be on the calendar. It should be already marked that it's canceled. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but when Shomer Week comes out, I'm sure it'll be all squared away. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank, right. you. Thank you. Same Thank to you, Rabbi.